Hello, my name is Mitch Joyner, and I'm president of the National Association of Social Workers. And we are here with another essential chat. This month is the second of our three-part series. And the three-part series is a reminder of hosting difficult conversations. And we're going to host a difficult conversation today about the rising hate facing the AAPI community. But before we begin, there's some things I'd like you to know. Number one, please let us know where you're from. So put your name and where you're from in the chat so we know exactly where people are from. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Now, before I begin this video, I would be remiss as a leader for us to not stop a minute and understand and think about the horrific murder by a white supremacist that occurred in Buffalo. Too often, this is occurring. And we often have people who will get online and say, my thoughts and prayers are with the community. I understand that. I appreciate that. We all need prayers, but prayers must be followed up with action. And that is take the time to discuss that murder with your family, even if you are not an African-American or a person of color, sit down and talk to your family about what occurred. Ask your family, do they know why those individuals were shot? Let your family know that it is not okay to hate people based on the color of their skin or their religious beliefs or who they love. See, Eradicating the human stain of racism begins at home. And we as parents and people who have loved ones must participate actively in listening to what is going on and listening to what is going on in our family. And if you know that someone is radicalized or listening to stations that talk about hate, get them some help and support because we cannot keep arriving at this place. The beauty of these United States is our diversity. We must always remember that. Don't let people tell racist jokes in your home. Have a code of ethics for your home and for your children. And if you do that, we will begin to eradicate the hate that is occurring in America. Now, this is also the May, which is generally when we honor Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders Heritage Month. So I generally start with a song, but we're going to not have that song. We're going to play a video. So May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Asian Pacific Americans account for one of the fastest growing population groups in the United States. More than 23 million Americans identify as Asian Pacific. That number is expected to rise to more than 34 million by 2040, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. People from India, China, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and other Asian Pacific nations have settled in what is now the United States since colonial times, helping build this nation. But people from Asia and the Pacific Islands have had to endure racism in this nation, including the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, and the forced internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. The National Association of Social Workers has long been committed to equal rights for all, including people who are Asian Pacific. Particularly at this time, when Asian Americans are experiencing increased hate crimes through the COVID-19 pandemic. This month honored the contributions of Asian Pacific social workers, such as these members from the NASW Guam chapter. And remember the many Asian Pacific NASW social work pioneers including Chia Chia Chien, San Francisco's first Asian psychiatric social worker, Sugio Ike Ikeda, former director of the Atlantic Center in Seattle and the nation's first Asian director of a nonprofit organization, and Yuriko Domoto Sukada, 
who provided social services to thousands of Japanese American families unfairly interned during World War II. And notable NASW members such as past NASW Social Worker of the Year Marsha Wong, who serves on the Los Angeles County Human Rights Commission, and Jan Lee Wong, who served as Executive Director of the NASW California Chapter for more than 25 years. Take time to learn more about Asian Pacific NASW Social Work Pioneers at naswfoundation.org and delve into the richness of Asian Pacific history and culture at the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, smithsonianapa.org. And enjoy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. As we celebrate, we also want to encourage you to come to the NASW conference, which is going to be at the end of June, and come and talk to us and let's have these hard conversations together. So, Stop Asian Hate is a slogan that is utilized at demonstrations and protests. It was created as a response against the violence and racial discrimination against Asian Americans after COVID-19 pandemic. We'll hear more about Stop AAPI Hate, a nonprofit organization. But first, I want to tell you about my guest. Every one of them has graciously accepted to be here today. And I say that because they, they do so many things. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about Jessica Kim, because Jessica Kim is the first person who I will introduce and who will speak. She is a licensed clinical social worker and a certified clinical trauma professional with over 15 years of practice experience in, age, in agencies, the government, and private practice settings, delivering mental health services to children, adults, and families. She's also a community organizer and speaker about racialized trauma and helped advocate for legislation of an AAPI curriculum in K through 12 education making New Jersey the second state in our country to mandate inclusion of AAPI studies. She serves on the board of Make Us Visible in New Jersey, as well as the Asian American Alliance in South Jersey. She is currently a PhD candidate in social welfare at the School of Social Policy and Practice at the University of Penn, where she is also the recipient of the CSWE Minority Fellowship Program. The Penn PhD Presidential Fellowship Award and the Hal Levin Award. Her research focuses on culturally reflective mental health practice for the AAPI community. She has three beautiful children and I'm sure like all of us, she wants to make sure they enter a world that is rid of hate. Now, I read Jessica's um, passionate plea uh, on social media, and I reached out to her immediately because I wanted her to know that we do care. And I wanted her to come on my show and talk about what social workers can and should be doing. Jessica? I guess I'm starting off the conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me um, to join this conversation. Uh, I just, I guess, want to start off by saying that when I uh, posted on my LinkedIn page, you know, I'm actually even trying to remember which post that was about because there's just been so many um, horrific incidents. I think this was the one um, in Yonkers um, of an Asian American woman who was um, punched 125 times, I think it was, right? Um, right in front of her apartment entrance as she was trying to get inside her home. And, uh, you know, I, I think I go through waves in response to this rising hate where there are times when 
I'm on top of all the stories. I'm reading them in great detail. I'm sharing them with all my friends and family. I want everyone to know that this is not going away, that we need to take this seriously. And then there are other moments when I need to pull away. I need to pull away because it's just too much. And I, I won't be able to function. I won't be able to go about my, my routine and get any work done and take care of my family unless, unless I pull away and take a break because it's just too much. Um, and so I think when I had come upon that particular headline, I was feeling um, pretty exasperated and just fed up. Like, when is, when is this going to end? Like, there's just no end in sight. Is anybody doing anything about this? And um, so it was in that sort of, I don't know, reaction um, that, I, that I, I posted on LinkedIn. You know, and, I, and when, <laughs> Dr. Joyner, when you responded and commented, you know, on my post that, that, you, that we should be talking about this, and that you wanted to do an essential chat. I, I mean, I certainly wasn't expecting that, um, but it gave me hope. It gave me hope that, that you know, maybe people do care, you know? Um, maybe people outside of the API community are paying attention and, and do wanna do something about this. So I just wanna start off by saying thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that and, and you know, holding space for us today to have this conversation. I think you're muted. I, I did because I had to cough and I didn't want to cough in the middle of what you were saying. Thank you, Jessica, because, you know, um, when we hear things, social workers often read and, and, and think about things. But we ha the re what I do as a social worker is reach out. Right. Let's just reach out and have a conversation about educate me about what I should know help me go because I will be working with people in the community and how do I let us know that in social work no matter what race you are from we have a responsibility to speak up and do something so with that that's why this conversation is occurring today so Jess it's due to you due to you as a social worker saying what are we doing and now I'm going to ask that question of our listening audience. And today, when we finish this conversation, I want each one of you to take some kind of action, no matter how small, but take some kind of action because change starts with each of us taking a step. So Ann Shaw. Now, Ann Shaw, this is my first time meeting you. She's an associate professor of psychology and affiliated faculty with the Global Asian Studies and Refugee and Forced Migration Studies program at DePaul University. Dr. Shaw's research focus broadly on health and mental health in the Asian American immigrant and refugee communities. She is a past president of the American as the Asian American Psychological Association, a national organization whose mission is to advance the mental health and well being of Asian American communities through research, professional practice, education, and policy. Recently, Dr. Salt was the lead researcher of the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Island COVID-19 Needs Assessment Project, a mouthful, but it was initiated by the Tri-Congressional Caucus with support from the National Urban League and multi multiple philanthropic organizations. The project involved over 50 Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community-based organizations, and over 3,700 Asian Americans and nearly 1,300 Native American Pacific Islander research participants. Dr. Saul's partners with community organizations across the country to conduct research and implement culturally and community-centered programs that promote health, wellness, healing, and resilience for Asian Americans in other groups. So 
Dr. Saul, and I'm going to call you Anne if it's okay. I want to thank you for coming here today, for being, I know what being president of a major association is all about. You know, that in itself is service, but your research is what we want to hear about and what you're learning about and some of those findings that we ourselves need to know about. So I'll have you speak at this time and introduce yourself. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and please call me Annie. Um, and also to correct, I have I'm, I was not president, but rather vice president of the Asian American Psychological Association. So I do not know the level of leadership responsibilities that you have um, have met. But <clears throat> nonetheless, it's it's um, great to be here with you all uh, today and talk a little bit about the research that I've done, some with um, my colleague and friend, uh, Manju Kulkarni, who you'll hear from shortly. Um, <clears throat> For many years, I've been doing community-engaged research with Asian American communities and organizations. Um, and during COVID-19, um, conducted a very large um, and extensive study in partnership with organizations across the country to look at how COVID has um, been impacting our diverse communities. Um, and I want to talk specifically about um, the work focused on the impact of racism uh, on our communities because and, and its relationship with mental health. We know, as, as you mentioned, that racism is not new. It's not something novel that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have experienced during the time of COVID um, and that Racism has not just impacts at the interpersonal level, but um, is really deep and structural. And that too has implications on mental health and well being for our communities. What we found um, through our research is that. Um, it, that the experience of discrimination and racism has certainly heightened um, during the pandemic, whether it's cyberbullying or um, direct um, comments that are made or uh, violence against individuals. Um, and that these experiences of racism, whether direct or vicarious, have filtered out like tentacles throughout our communities. So much so that the majority of um, Asian Americans now experience the US as far more dangerous for them and, and people like them. So there's this pr pr profound um, and widespread loss of safety and security that Asian Americans have experienced. And we know through research, through our practice, that direct and vicarious racism, they both, um, all forms of racism have impacts on our mental health as well as our physical health. And that racism is itself a form of trauma. It results in feelings of uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety, intrusive thoughts, anger, avoidance, lowered self-esteem, hypervigilance, and this, this, loss of security, that you can't go out and do the things that you need to do, carry about, go, go about your life because you're afraid. Um, and you're afraid for yourself, your family, and your community. And we know that racial trauma, that experience of trauma that people have when they encounter racism, whether at the level of microaggressions or violent acts, that these are natural reactions that we all would experience if we feel this kind of shock to our existence. Um, we know that this is, these are normal reactions um, and they're not a form of mental illness, but they do impact on our mental health. And so we, um, we really do need to consider racism and well-being as interconnected and eradicating racism being um, kind of a priority if we want to make an impact on community mental health and well being. Um, and so uh, I think it's really important for us to think about racism and the impact of racism 
on all the work that we do, whether as social workers or for me training um, clinical psychologists and community psychologists, that we really need to focus um, and understand racism, ask about racism, ask about our clients' experiences with racism, um, and intervene to help our communities, our clients heal. And um, that does mean connecting like Jess has done um, to encourage people to understand better their communities, their, develop their cultural identity, their cultural pride, and connect within their communities and across different racial and other groups so that uh, we can develop systems for healing um, all of our communities um, and do that by drawing on community and cultural strengths and forms of resilience. Thank you, Annie. Um, thank you so much. That was a great summation. We're going to have some questions for you. Your research is intriguing, and I, but it, but it, it calls for action, and that is something that we really have to think about: is action. And so that brings me to the third guest, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me while I read the bio because it's important. It came out of a movement. And I love for us to understand that it takes someone like Manu Kukarni, who is the executive director of the AAPI Equity Alliance, a coalition of over 40 community-based organizations, which serves and represents 1.5 million Asian American and Pacific Islanders in Los Angeles County. In March 2020, Manu co-founded Stop AAPI Hate, the nation's legal, 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 I'm saying leading aggregator of COVID-19 related hate incidents against AAPI community. Recently, Manu was one of five individuals awarded the Racial Equity Award by Bank of America for her service of breaking down systemic racial barriers and creating economic opportunities for Black, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Native Americans, individual, individuals nationwide. In 2022, Manu was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential individuals and by Bloomberg Business Week as one of 50 individuals with the ability to move markets or shape ideas and policies. With the co-founders of Stop AAPI Hate, Cynthia Chow and Russell Yong, Cynthia and Cynthia, Russell and Manu was awarded the 2020 Webby Social Movement of the Year Award. Manu's work was featured in the New York Times and on CBS News and CNN, as well as other numerous ethnic media outlets. Manu is a member of the Los Angeles uh, City Ethics Commission and the California Racial and, Identi uh, and Identity Profiling Advisory Board. Prior to her work at AAPI Equity Alliance, Manu served as director of the South Asian Network, one of the nation's oldest community-based organizations advancing the health safety and well-being of South Asian Americans. While there, I have to say this, while there she received the White House Champion of Change Award from none other than President Barack Obama for her dedication to improving healthcare access for Asian American communities. It is our pleasure to have Manu, who has a bachelor's degree from Duke and a Juris Doctorate 
from Boston University School of Law. Thank you for coming here. You are, you have, you are a change agent. So you're going to tell us what we need to know. Well, first off, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mitt, for that kind and generous introduction. Really just such an honor to be part of this esteemed panel, um, to join Jess and Annie. And um, let me just say, too, that you know we had an opportunity to work closely um, with Dr. Saw and uh, in doing um, some of the work of a survey. Uh, she, of course, did a, a much larger project and, and a small part Part of it involved our organization and surveying our respondents. And there was so much information that came out of that. So she's been a wonderful partner and friend. Um, again, my name is Manju Kulkarni, and um, I'm one of the co-founders of Stop AAPI Hate. And want to just share with you sort of our origin story, um, which actually began in some ways with an individual who is part of your community, a social worker. Um, in February of 2020, uh, my local organization, AAPI Equity Alliance, was approached by um, an individual uh, who had worked at one of our member organizations. And this was a mother who is a social worker in Los Angeles and uh, found out that her son had been physically attacked and verbally assaulted on the schoolyard. Again, in February 2020, he was approached by another child um, and he, uh, the child said to him, you're a COVID carrier, go back to China. Um, he was just shocked and perplexed and just reflexively answered, I'm not Chinese. And when he did so, he was punched in the face and head 20 times. Um, so we learned of this incident from her supervisor and immediately took action. We began to work with the family to ensure that their needs were being met by the school district. And we held a press conference with our local officials to say that this type of racism, um, that any racism really would not be tolerated in Los Angeles. Um, soon after that, because we did get some media attention, I was approached by Russell and Th Cynthia, um, who were seeing the same type of incidents in the Bay Area. And so together we formed Stop AAPI Hate in March. Let me say one more thing about that incident. Keep in mind what was going on in February of 2020. It was really before we saw um, much of COVID-19 um, even approaching our shores. And I am sad to say that this incident happened before there was a single confirmed case of COVID-19 in Southern California. So we saw that racism, in fact, preceded the virus and its spread. So hate was more virulent and ferocious than even the virus and the disease. Um, so after we founded Stop AAPI Hate, uh, we were very surprised to learn within just a few weeks with little outreach, uh, we received several hundred incident reports. And now um, in a 21 month period, we have 11,000 from all 50 states and the District of Columbia. And what do we know from our data? Sadly, most of these incidents take place in the public, in parks, streets, sidewalks, businesses, that um, a majority of individuals who report to us are women. So we are seeing that Asian American women are bearing the brunt of the racism and discrimination. When we look at the type of incidents, verbal harassment tops the list at 63%, followed by physical assaults at 16%, and civil rights violations, 11%. So this is workplace discrimination, um, bullying in schools, and also refusal of service in businesses and public transit. Um, when we look at the communities that have been impacted, uh, it's not only Chinese American, but also other East Asian populations, Korean, Japanese, Southeast Asian, including uh, Filipino, as well as Vietnamese, even South Asians and Pacific Islanders 
have experienced the racism and reported it to us. A few of the key takeaways are this affects all AAPIs. Um, and in fact, we know that, you know, even though 11,000 is quite a significant number, our survey with the Edelman firm showed that one in five Asian Americans, one in five Pacific Islanders, that's 20%, have experienced some form of racism or discrimination in the last two years. That's about four to five million individuals. Again, four to five million individuals in our country. Number two, and this is a very, very important point. If you leave with nothing else from, from my remarks today, the vast majority are, of these are not crimes. So they're not hate crimes. Um, so it's a bit of an, it's in fact, quite a misnomer to use the term hate crime. And we don't use that term. We say hate incidents. Crimes are those things like um, battery, rape, so sexual assault, homicide, property damage. And these mo incidents, while they are painful and traumatic, they involve things that we as a society don't deem to be crimes. So verbal harassment, those violations of civil rights, we can still get redress and seek comprehensive solutions, but it means that incarceration and mass incarceration is not the answer, and neither is more policing of our brown and black communities. Um, next, there's not a single uh, profile of perpetrators. Studies by Mich University of Michigan professor and University of Maryland professor have shown that African-Americans, contrary to what you've seen on social media or mainstream media, are not the most common type of perpetrators. In fact, it is uh, more, more likely white individuals. And that this is not simply about interpersonal attacks, but institutional racism against our communities. And I'll stop there. Thank you. I was just sitting back getting ready to take notes and you said you're going to stop. But oh my God, I'm the host of this, right? Um, so I'm going to, to say to all of you, you're at my home. You know, uh, we're, we're not able to be together. I wish we could be together, but let us just all sit back, relax and listen to each other. And what, what question do you have for are people that I invited today. I invited you all over. And what resonated with you to say, well, I want to have a follow-up question on that. Go ahead. Um, I have a question of um, Annie and Jess. So, you know, from your vantage point um, as individuals who work with communities in the mental health sector, what do you think are the most effective strategies to address the racial trauma, the, you know, pain, suffering, and hardship our AAPI communities are experiencing? Um, well, my answer is not very sexy and glamorous. It's sort of, uh, you know, um, it's a long game, you know, it's education, and that's what I'm working on right now. Uh, I think um, when I talk to a lot of people, the quick fix seems to be, oh, we need more police presence to feel safer in our communities. And I just don't think that that's um, the answer. Uh, I think it's like putting a Band-Aid on something and really um, it's going to, you know, uh, maybe bring a sense of false safety to certain people um, while bringing, um, you know, a threat of their sense of safety to other communities of color. So. It, I just don't see that as being a sustainable long-term solution. And so, you know, there are people who have been really looking at uh, what we can do about education. And that's where I've been focusing my energies lately. Um, it's the work that I've been doing with Make Us Visible in New Jersey and partnering with lots of other coalition groups throughout um, the state. And now that we have, you know, pushed for this legislation and made it law, and New Jersey is now the second state where we've mandated um, the inclusion of teaching Asian American history now we're fighting for implementation because that's the whole other <laughs> half of this is how do you get 600 school districts throughout the state to actually teach this 
in every grade, K to 12, right? Um, it's one thing to just have access to lesson plans, but it's another thing to have um, uh, trainings and support provided to teachers who are already overwhelmed, who are already so busy, um, underpaid as it is, right? We're just, and so now it's like, oh, wait, now we have to teach this other thing. I, you know, how am I gonna, we have to support them. And so we're working very hard right now to um, develop trainings and, and provide uh, free as well as professional development trainings for teachers so that they can um, know how to deliver these lesson plans in a culturally appropriate way. And I think this education piece is really, really critical and it's gonna take time. So some people don't wanna hear that. I've talked to some friends that, yeah, 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 that's great, Jess, but what can I do now? That is something that you can be doing now. You can be talking to your local school district, right? Getting involved with parent groups, the Board of Ed, you know, speaking up about the importance of this and how this, you can support your local school districts. Because this is this idea of teaching, you know, Asian American history and, and contributions. It's it is um, a way of um, helping not just Asian American kids, but also um, other groups of children to be able to understand that Asian Americans are part of this country, that we helped build this country. I think it's going to help um, mitigate these really pervasive stereotypes that we've been dealing with for a long time. This idea that we don't belong here, um, that we're foreigners, that we're outsiders, uh, education to see visibly stories, lesson plans of prominent figures who have um, shaped our history, I think is very, very critical. I mean, um, Manju, I just heard you speak. I don't know if you realize, but I'm actually at <laughs> the uh, Asian American Foundation Summit with you this morning. So I heard you speak. So, uh, you know, the, the TAF data is sort of fresh on my mind. But one of the things that, you know, the, the Asian American Foundation you know, they did a whole uh, status report. You should go online and read it if you haven't uh, heard of this report. Uh, but one of, you know, one of the things that they asked um, was over about 5,000 people, all Americans throughout the country. It's a, it's a nationally representative sample, you know, to name one prominent Asian American figure. And the, the majority of Americans couldn't name a single Asian American person that was, you know, prominent, a famous person. Majority of people could not name a single person. And then after that, the second most popular uh, person name that comes to mind for the majority of Americans who were able to name someone was Jackie Chan. Jackie <laughs> Chan is the most prominent Asian American person that comes to the mind of the Americans that could think of someone. And Jackie Chan is not even American. <laughs> So what does that tell you? We have a long way to go uh, to to uh, to help shift this, you know, the psyche of of Americans and what it is that they think of this implicit bias when we think of Asian Americans. And there's so many stories, but this kind of invisibility and erasure is very, very damaging. And I think it robs our children of the opportunity to develop um, their identity, to fully form who it is they are as Asian Americans when they don't see um, themselves being representative and positive portrayals in their learning environment. I think it really, really, it's very harmful. And I, and I, I say that not just you know based on um, research, but also on my own lived experience as a kid growing up here. You know, my, my parents immigrated here when I was two. So I, this is my home. You know, America's, you know, my home. And and I never uh, learned about Asian American history growing up. And all I ever saw in the media were portrayals of us being awkward and geeky, um, outsiders with accents, um, asexual um, or hypersexual, right? If, 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 this, if you're a woman, objectified, fetishized, um, or martial arts experts, and those are the only images um, that I got as, as a young person growing up, but that really impacts the way that you feel about yourself. And so it's very harmful and I'm very, um, excited, although it's a long road ahead at this, at the prospect of things being better for my children's generation. I'll stop there. Annie. Yeah, Jess, I, um, 
I'm just meeting you. Thanks to thanks to Mitt and this essential chat. And um, neither of us are necessarily from education backgrounds, but um, I live in Illinois, which is the first state to pass um, <clears throat> a law mandating Asian American history be taught in K through 12 schools. New Jersey being number two. And now we're working on implementation. And even though I have at least three other day jobs, um, something that keeps me going is work volunteering um, with um, community orgs like Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago to work on implementation, getting schools and teachers ready for um, implementation to make sure that it's more than just an add-on, like you were saying, and more than just a cultural celebration for Lunar New Year, how, how if, if Asian Americans are covered in our curriculum, that's typically how they're covered, right? But to make it deep and, and integrated, truly. And, and I, I also resonate with what you're saying of how important it is um, on our, our youth um, to have their cultures and their backgrounds be reflected in the curriculum, how, how important it is for their identity development and for their well being. And not just our Asian American youth, but for all of our youth. And then thinking, about the long game, like you mentioned, of how important it is for all of us to see um, and understand um, Asian Americans as part of the fabric of our country. That is so critical, right, to um, enhancing well-being at the community and societal level. So I'm going to also take a stab at that. this answer, is that it is systemic. It's institutionalized. And so racism is at every core of all of our major institutions. And it is a long game and we know that systems change is slow, but it is important that we infiltrate the system and allow those who are at the Department of Education to in fact say, yes, we will have this curriculum because you know that there is this backlash in this country, uh, critical race theory, and we're not gonna be able to teach that when really and truly critical race theory is American history. If you don't really look at, and if you just kind of understand what goes on, and it was mentioned Chinese Exclusion Act, people don't know what the Chinese Exclusion Act is and how many times it was amended over and over again, and that it was illegal to testify against free white people here in the United States. So having our history and putting it in education is important, but it is also important for us to remember the job that we have to do as leaders, to make sure that people are, are represented at our tables. So when we have, so people can speak up and out and help us lead change. Uh, you know, a question that I always have is racism is a sickness and why it's not in that DSM. I don't know. Um, I tend to think if we began to say racist people were sick, I mean, the sick, um, there would be a need to correct your own illness that is from within. But we have not done that in this country. We have always said the victims and we always have trauma, but the perpetrators tend to be allowed to continue to grow because our institutions has not recognized that when you're a racist in this country, you are a sick person and you need help. And so I think our professions must come together. I think our races must come together because when you look at things as it breaks down to the population of the United States, if Latina, Latinos, African Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders band together, do you know the political power we would have? We could actually change systems. So that's kind of my answer. What's another question one of you might have for each other? Well, I just want to say real quick before we move on to another question that I, I totally agree with you about this multiracial coalition building. And I think that it it will be a natural byproduct once we have more education mm -hmm. uh, that centers the stories and contributions of other population groups like Asian American Pacific Islanders. Um, because I think vast majority of Asian Americans, especially recent immigrants, 
don't know the history mm-hmm. of of Asian Americans and our shared oppression, and um, and if they're missing that piece, they're not going to understand how we're all in this together. Mm-hmm that we're all part of systems that are not designed to benefit us. And so it's so critical to have that educational piece about our shared history, mm-hmm. particularly as Asian Americans are the fastest growing racial group mm-hmm. um, in this country. A- and as our population is steadily rising, we're going to have more and more um, first generation immigrants who really need to understand this history, this Asian American mm-hmm. history. And other racial groups need Mm -hmm. to understand this as well so that they don't fear the rising population of Asian Americans in this country, that they can understand that this this xenophobia, right, and this fear of contamination, uh, you know, and all these things are are old. They're old stereotypes and old fears. And so I think having all of us being aware of, of these things that happened in the past will be very helpful and necessary and critical. Mm-hmm. at this time. I agree wholeheartedly. I, I'm going to say to our listening audience, feel free to add your questions as well as we're asking questions of each other. Um, it's not too often we get to sit and have tea and talk about this. Uh, so if you you know, are leading an organization, which you are, what all of you are in ways what is the one thing that you would do if you if you had to passionately speak to your group about bringing all groups to the table? How would you make that happen? You know, because sometimes we elect people and when we elect people, it often looks like the various people, the same people get elected. But how would you how would you push for inclusion? And and really, you know, when we're, everybody's using this this term D, E and I and B for belonging diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. But a lot of people, when you start to practice it, it's a whole different thing. Um, so how would you address D, E, and I, and B in your organization? And well, I can and, take a stab at that question. Sure. Um, I mean, perhaps it's because um, I earlier in my career, I was a civil rights attorney. But, you know, the point you made earlier is so important in terms of, you know, interrogating our institutions and really calling them out in terms of what's going on right now, because we are seeing, um, you know, we can vote, you know, election after election, but if we don't see policy change, and in fact, if as, um, you know, leaders unfortunately are doing now, they're engaged in active voter suppression. They're engaged in voter nullification. I don't know if people realize our democracy, our multiracial democracy is very short lived. Mm -hmm. It's only been around since 1965. Um, And we're actually seeing in slow motion, it disappear in front of our very eyes. Uh, We were very, very close to the end of that in 2020. And we may actually see that happen uh, this year or next in the the next presidential cycle. Um, To your point earlier, Mitt, in terms of the DSM and, and, you know, calling out the sickness, you know, I'm going to take a a very perhaps cynical approach, which is that I don't know if we can fully pathologize hate simply because too many people have it. Mm. Right. Which is to say that um, our, you know, forefathers, our founding um, fathers, you know, they were slave owners. Right. So they were engaged in what was the global slave trade in genocide. And so remembering those particular pieces. Right. That it. um, So for me, the the question of DEI. is one of, you know, I think narrative change is important and I think acceptance is important, but ultimately if you don't have laws and policies that enable Mm -hmm. self-actualization, voluntary programs where we sit and sing Kumbaya are sort of meaningless um, at the end of the day. So uh, for me, it really is ultimately about about us voting, about us getting policies that support our communities. 
Yes, you know, I say and I warn people that our American democracy is falling right before our eyes. And I, I say that and people are like, what, what are you talking about? But as you are looking at the various states, as you are looking at censoring ship, people of color, taking out books out of the library, um, as you are wanting to erase the little bit of history that is there, right? The little bit of history about uh, the slave trade, about the Trail of Tears and really what it was about 9066. What is 9066 and what did it mean? And why did America just round up all Japanese ancestry and, and citizens alike and take off to what I call concentration camps? They lost so much during those times. And Native Americans taking the land, right? And pushing them back to reservations. And we're looking at the boarding schools, but that's a lot of information, right? It's a lot of information, but our systems, our, this white supremacist system is honkering down right now. And um, we have to realize that. Now I know Dennis, Krog, Dennis had a question, but I'm gonna take Alexis question for the younger generation coming up. What would your advice be in the terms of mental health with all that is going on? How should we act to create and change in our communities? It's a rough time for kids, right? You know, it, it is a rough time for, for kids. Does anyone want to take that question? Because I do this for my grandkids. That's the only reason why I do this work. I don't do this work for any other thing that I have two African-American grandsons and I want them to live in a world where they will be judged by the content of their character not by the color of their skin. So what, what do you say and how do you, how do you help children? In terms well, of the that's mind? a really big conversation, but I'll just say something um, maybe a little more specific here. Thanks for the question, Alexis. Um, yeah, we are, I think the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a national emergency last year for child and adolescent mental health. So we're going through a mental health crisis among our young people. This is across the board, not just Asian American youth. Um, so it's a, a big problem. Our mental health system is under-resourced. We don't have the workforce to meet the rising demand uh, of, of mental health care services. Um, and and it, it still continues to be the case that um, Asian Americans and uh, communities of color really have low rates of service use in our mental health system for lots of reasons but um you know one of them tends to be lack of culturally responsive services that are mm -hmm. available um, language barriers are a huge one for asian american um, pacific islander populations um but so I, I just want to acknowledge that this is a really really deep um, problem that we're going to have to be dealing with for many years to come and, and covid really has made everything so much worse uh, so I think we need to really be thinking outside of the box of what it means, what mental health care means, you know, outside of this traditional model of sitting in a therapist's office. Um, it, there's just too many people who never make it through the door of a therapist's office. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you do, great. I mean, I was a therapist for 15 years. I highly advocate for it. It's very, it can be very, very helpful if you access it, right? But for everyone else who doesn't ever make it there, what are you gonna do? Um, so we need to really start thinking outside the box about what else can mental health care look like and where else uh, you know, can this happen? And it's great that we have telehealth now. I think that that's helpful, but I, I personally have really been trying to look at faith-based spaces. I think um, religious spaces, churches, uh, for example, are a really great uh, space um, to go to because um, at least uh, in uh, some Asian American groups, there's literature that supports this idea that that's one of the first places that people go to for help. They go to their faith leaders, clergy, um, for mental health concerns. And so they're already going to these spaces anyway. So we need to find ways to equip 
better equip um, lay leaders in the community, um, faith leaders, to have the kinds of resources that will help them be more prepared to meet this rising need. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing some work with an organization called Mustard Seed Generation. It's a nonprofit, and we just developed um, a training program for Korean American church leaders to improve their mental health literacy. It's a seven week program. And uh, we just finished our first cohort, signed up about 50 people across the country. It was um, with synchronous, um, asynchronous. Uh, videos that we recorded and then um, synchronous discussion groups where they were learning together in seven weeks. And we just closed that out and it was it was quite successful. So we're really happy about that. And it's sort of like, it's a pilot really. We don't really, you know, we've never done this before, but, but it's things like this that I think we're gonna have to try to invest more of our, our energies into expanding. So we're going to go start posting questions, and I call this the rapid fire section. We're going to answer these questions within two minutes, and then we'll put up another one and another one so that our listening audience will feel engaged. Okay, who wants to take a stab at Dennis's question? How do we impact all of the current nationalist and racist acceptance that seems to be increasing in our country? Yes, people are feeling bold enough to be prejudiced, right? Um, I was at the gas tank and somebody said, I said, oh my God, the gas prices. Just, but your people voted for Biden. And I'm like, what, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, so, so people are bold to come into your fa- space right now. So wh- what do you say? And you, I think you, you might be able to take a stab at that. Well, um, I think that there are a number of factors involved. I know that when we look at our data at Stop API Hate, uh, we did a report actually about, you know, some of what you're talking about, Mitt, which is um, the, you know, specifically, uh, you know, racist rhetoric. uh, And in our case, the anti-China or anti-Chinese rhetoric. And we saw, sadly, that um, about 28% of the incidents uh, involved language which was very similar to our previous president. So weaponizing terms like uh, Wuhan virus, China virus, Kung flu, saying things like go back to your country. And when we look at those factors, you're absolutely right, that people have felt emboldened. They've been felt emboldened by our political leaders, by what they watch on TV. Um, In fact, there was a study that was done uh, that I just found so interesting that they um, asked uh, Fox News uh, viewers to switch to CNN for one month for exactly 30 days. And they found that after 30 days of viewing, their views on most political issues actually changed, right? That they were getting uh, inaccurate news. They Mm -hmm. were getting racist rhetoric. We've heard, in fact, after the Buffalo mass shooting, we've now come to understand the idea, um, which has gotten profile on Fox, of the great replacement theory, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And this is weaponized not only against people of color, but also Jewish Americans to say that they're in cahoots or they're directing us right against uh, white people. And sadly, you know, this is not new, actually. Um, This has been with us since the 1800s, most of the 1900s. We've we've seen it over and over again. And it's to me, it's kind of like a geyser frankly, which is, uh, it may not quite be like Yellowstone, which it goes off every 90 minutes, but certainly every few years Mm -hmm. we get this. Now, the one thing that I am hopeful about to address this is, you know, our communities have been resilient. We've stood up. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, people think that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders haven't. We stood up against, you know, incarceration, uh, uh, facilities during World War II, we stood up to not only Chinese Exclusion Act, but the Asiatic Bard Zone Act 
which prevented all of our communities from coming here. Um, and we protested when Vincent Chin was killed mm -hmm. and there was no prison time given for the for his killers. Um, so I know that we're stronger than ever, but a point you made earlier is so important, Mitt, which is we all need to be in this together. Mm -hmm. And and it's so important what you're doing through NASW um, to make that happen. Thank you. Question from a messenger. Asian and Pacific Islanders are often portrayed as the model minority. How do we address this myth? And could we lead to resentment and division. Oftentimes you'll hear people say, oh, wow, they don't study hard in school. It's as it's through osmosis that someone gets a 4.0 who's from the Asian American community. They didn't study hard. They didn't earn that, right? Again, you know, I'm going to go back to my systemic stuff. I'm going to go back to that curriculum. I'm going to go back to that teacher that allows that to be said. But um, we know that it's out there. So what... Can I say just one thing before we begin before we begin this round of questioning? Look at your neighbors. Who's your neighbors? Do what we're doing on this essential chat. Invite them over for tea. You all may be of the same race. You may not mix it up. But we've got to talk in our homes about, do you see what's going on? Do you see what they're saying about the flu and who they're blaming it on? We've got to learn to help people look at primary sources. No, we can't do that. See, if we allow our neighbors to shut their doors and for racism to grow in those homes, we're, we're just talking to the choir here, right? It is important that every America, every American understand that racism affects them too. And even though you may not wear brown, Black or being Asian American Pacific Islander, it affects you. So that's just what I want to say is I'm doing these essential chats, hoping that everybody have their own little chat. That just don't leave it here. Because what's being an ally, Annie? You know, we, we talk about allyship. We're all allies of someone. Um, but allies have to learn to stay in the room. Far too often, I find that allies, if, if I don't like what you're saying, like, oh my God, you're talking about African-Americans now, so I'm gonna buy, you know, close the door. Or if someone is saying something different than what you may believe, we tend to cancel people out. But that's not, the, that's not our role. Our role is to be in those uncomfortable places, is it not? And to address and give the truth, right? So how would you, what, what would you say um, about if, if you were in your community and all of your neighbors were not of your same race, right? Um, how would you encourage them to get together and talk about what's going on? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And, and um, whether it's the model minority myth or stereotypes about other groups, these perpetuate in our silos, right? So it is really important for us to develop allyship, to develop these inter um, intergroup kinds of dialogues that you are um, talking about. Um, and it's also important, somebody asked earlier about anti-racist practice, right? That begins with self-reflection. And um, part of the work that we all need to do is, self-reflection, reflection within our communities. What are the biases and stereotypes that keep us Asian Americans from um, reaching out to our black and brown neighbors as allies? Um, and how do we show up for one another? I think those are those are the like the sometimes the difficult conversations that we need mm -hmm. to have in order to build up that allyship so that we can truly um, be in solidarity with one another. And these myths and stereotypes about each other's groups perpetuate because of systems of white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't address that and if we don't see all of it under the umbrella of white supremacy, we'll continue to be siloed and not be able to work together towards that allyship that you're talking about. You said something right there, perpetuate. We stay in our silos. We got to open up. You know, we got to open up those windows and have that exchange. Alice K. Locklear, 
Uh, she's on our board, so I thank her for this question. What ideas would you suggest for student engagement through service learning and coursework to increase cultural awareness of AAPIs? I do some service learning um, teaching and I'm all about student engagement. And I would say partner with community organizations like those that Manju leads. Um, set up these service learning opportunities so that students can really not just one-offs, not just have an, an afternoon, but you know, in a in a long semester long or quarter long course, be deep in, in those communities, understand, um, understand what the community's needs are and what their issues are and how social workers or students from other professions, training in other professions can really use their tools that they're developing towards the service of these communities. Carissa, how can you engage in anti-racist work while working with individual clients? So, you know, that. How, how, do, how do we work? And I always say that, you know, in social work, we have this thing that goes on about micro, meso, and macro. I, I don't believe in any of it because I believe we're the cord. I don't care where you work. You have a responsibility to make sure that it's that it works on the ground. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I understand people have their shingle out and they just want to see their clients, but they have an opportunity to go to Congress and testify about what works and what doesn't work. So um, how, how do you engage in anti-racist work, racism work, while working with individual clients? Because you hear the stories. I mean, you know, you, you hear the stories in private practice about the only reason I'm here is because people call me these names and I don't feel my self-worth. And I don't know if I want to live anymore because the world is so hateful. We hear, you know, suicide is on the uptick. It is real in our country. And young kids, if we look at the work of Dr. Michael Lindsay, we know that young kids as early as six and seven are hanging themselves because they feel bullied by hate. And as you said, um, yeah, you know, harassment is not a, a crime, a hate crime but it wears on people. You said, Jess, that it gets so tiring that sometimes you just feel like you gotta pull away. But young kids, sometimes that's their only, you know, they're in, you know, the case that you talked about, about a young kid being beaten up because they're bringing the Chinese virus. What does that say to other people who are other kids from that same community that look at that, this can happen to me. So how do we how do we do this work with individuals, but then where else do we go? Well, I can jump in here. Um, you know, we know, and and the head of the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Rochelle Walensky, said uh, just a few months ago that racism is among the greatest public health threats in America today. And, you know, um, in one of the classes I've taught at UCLA, uh, specifically on our healthcare institutions, I talk about the fact that, you know, when we look at African-American maternal mortality rates, infant mortality rates, a lot of that is because, and we can, we can really pin it to the racism, right, the bodily impacts, uh, on that, as well as on hypertension, uh, on even cardiovascular disease, and and even I think diabetes. Uh, one thing I've seen, even from my students at UCLA, is that need for mental health help. And you know, I'm not an expert in this field, uh, like Annie and Jess, but you know, it seems to me that support groups may offer one answer. So people don't feel that they're in isolation. Um, in that survey that we did uh, with Annie, we were so heartened by one particular statistic, which is that 28% of individuals said they felt a decrease in some of their symptoms simply by reporting 
to stop AAPI hate. So the fact that people feel that sense of community, they may feel that they're part of a solution, uh, I think is so important. And you remember that I mentioned that the mother of this child was a social worker. Part of why I mentioned that is because when we worked with the school district, she was very intentional in saying um, she got a lot of pressure and the family did to bring uh, to press charges against the boy uh, who perpetrated the harm. And because of her social work background, she said, no, no, thank you. She believed in restorative justice practices. She understood that actually even for from what little she knew of the boy is that he had some uh, developmental delays and learning disabilities. And so he needed help, yeah. right? He did not need to be put into the school to prison pipeline. And so that's what I think is so important too, is that in your individual work, you actually have opportunities for some of that systemic change um, that I think is so important because all of you come into contact with thousands of clients, right? Um, every day, every year. And so to the extent that you uh, bear witness and bring that, uh, those beliefs and those values to your work, it's, it's so critical. Yes, yes. I had to put on my glasses because I can't read unless it... I was so happy to see darker skinned South Asian women featured predominantly in the Brigantons on Netflix. <laughs> what can we do to improve portrayals of people who are a API? Well, I'll just jump in for a second because I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, and I was a fan of the second season and felt the exact same thing mm -hmm. because you don't see dark complected folks, um, especially from our community. And so really refreshing. And, you know, to the point that um, Jess made earlier, this representation is so important. And at the summit, she and I were both at um, not only that survey, right, that found that people and, you know, just Americans generally don't know us. It's because we're not represented, right? We're not on TV. We're not in the movies. Um, and even when we are, unfortunately, we're the only ones watching those because right now there's some fabulous shows. There's Pachinko. Um, you know, you mentioned Bridgerton. There's so many out there. Um, and, you know, even some of the movies, Minari from last year. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened, right? Even Minari was a story about Americans. And guess what? It was put in the foreign film category. Mm -hmm. Right. So talk about perpetual foreignness. Right. Uh, it's supposed to take place in the South where I grew up. And yet it was uh, just because of the language deemed to be a foreign film. So so that's a little bit, I think, of what we need uh, moving forward is just to see, um, you know, more non-white faces so that people know and understand uh, that we're out there and, and that we're humans. Right. <laughs> we have humanity. Is, is that too much to ask? <laughs> well, you know, again, infiltrating, and, and I always say to social workers, there's so many jobs, and I'm sure you say it, Annie, to psychologists. Infiltrate all these systems. Just don't think you have to work in nonprofit. Go work at all of these places at Netflix. I mean, the more and more representation we have of people of color at the tables of change, the better off we can to change these systems. I mean, I see some young people doing some magnificent things um, that have just kind of went out to California and broke into Netflix and all of those movie and became producers and writers of these films. And um, that is where we have to be. At the same time, we must recognize from the other side, as we, we racial identity theory always talked about, you need people on both sides of the, the aisle. Right. You need the defensive people and the offensive people to begin to make change. And the burden is on us, though. You know, that, that's that's the thing that I keep going back to. I know there are days when that shooting happened, 
I was actually in North Carolina celebrating a woman who was 104 or 103 years of age, Hortense McClinton, who had done some magnificent things. And Hortense gave two speeches at 103. She's a social worker, a social work pioneer. But what she said with me that almost made me have chills, she said, I'm afraid for us right now. Now, Understand, Hortense McClinton was born over 103 years ago during the Jim Crow era. Her father had to move to a town, a colored only town in Oklahoma, Boley, Oklahoma, because the Ku Klux Klan was trying to kill him, right? And she says today in 2022, this is the most scared she's ever been. So I want us all to put this sense of urgency into this work that we're doing. These conversations that we're holding and why I call, call these critical conversations, this rise of hate in the AAPI community. We've got we've to create some action plan. We don't have time to sit down and think about, oh my goodness, because as, as was said by one of our guests, democracy. It's, it's happening. You know, you know, it, it is happening. You can see it happening. And so I want you as people who are listening in the listening audience, not to just assume the, the traditional jobs of social workers, but to take those jobs where you can't be, your, you might be the only one, but that you stand up and make some change. What, what brought you to law school? And you, what, what, what made you come to law school in the first place? Because that, that was a woman in law school at Boston. Um, well, you know, I had the opportunity, Mitt, uh, after uh, college. My first uh, job actually was at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Oh. Um, and uh, in working there, I actually, sadly, in 1991, was working on voter suppression laws mm. and, and looking at what some of the legislative intent was. And that's part of why I say it was it was nothing new. Um, and and even, you know, some of what inspired me is, in fact, um, my mother was discriminated against when I was in elementary school, when she went for an interview uh, to work at a physician at a local hospital in Montgomery. Uh, a panel of white male interviewers really just asked her one question, which is, why do you foreigners come here and take all of our jobs? So um, while I was actually planning to be a doctor and follow my parents' footsteps, it was after that that I they brought a, a class action lawsuit uh, and uh, in and were successful in it and actually changed some of the laws around who could be a foreign medical uh, a resident. Uh, from a non-European country. And so when I saw that redress can happen from the law, I, I really chose uh, that field. But let me just say one thing. I know we're we're coming to the, the end of this program. I just want to talk about solidarity between our communities. And people don't often realize they've heard of the model minority and the wedge it's created between African-Americans and uh, Asian-Americans specifically. But we've actually been in a lot of the struggles together. People don't realize that um, it's actually because of civil rights leaders that we got the Immigration uh, Act of 1965 that allowed many of our families, my own family, mm -hmm. uh, just like Jess, as I came when I was two, it was because of the Immigration Act that let my parents in this country. Um, and when you see that iconic photo of the Selma to Montgomery march, Folks are wearing lays that were brought to them by a Pacific um, Islander pastor, Pastor Inouye, who said, I want to show you that we're in solidarity with you. And so you see him also in the picture, but you see all of the leaders, including Dr. King, wearing those lays. So, so we've been in this struggle, and I think there are a lot of us who participated in Black Lives Matter marches. Um, so I want to just continue to urge uh, all of our communities to work together and not take on, you know, white supremacy tries to to divide and conquer us, mm -hmm. but but we've got to refuse to let that happen. 
Very important. Uh, thank you for that information. Southern Poverty Law Center. I, I still send my money to Southern Poverty Law Center. I still do. Annie, um, what, what, what might you like to add to this conversation at this time as we're winding down? But, we'll, you know, we still have some time. I'll, I'll, I'll come back and ask of you all to give a profound closing statement. But, um, Annie, what would you like to add? Oh, I was just reflecting on what Manju said. And every time I, I am in a room with Manju, I learn something new that I did not know, both personally and just, you know, she always drops knowledge. So I, yeah. I, I really appreciate that. I'm just reflecting on that. But, you know, just thinking about the work that um, we've been doing in the last few years around um, anti-Asian racism, um, now I just want to focus on healing. I want to focus on. Um, we we know that this that racism will not be eradicated. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, in our lifetime, we're doing we're playing the long game, like Jess mentioned, of education, and um, showing up and trying to increase representation. Um, but you know the the when we when we are in solidarity, when we come to understand our histories as intertwined. Um, that is that make that makes such a big difference to youth mental health, to community mental health, um, and gives us um, the the question earlier about uh, addressing youth mental health and community change. I see those two things as interconnected. When we give youth an opportunity to empower themselves and learn about their communities, um, that is also an important way to enhance resilience and mental health for, for our young people as well. So all of these things I, I see as interconnected and I see our healing as interconnected as well and achieve through solidarity and community action and beginning with critical consciousness and learning about our histories. Yes. Jess, you are a CSWE Minority Fellow. Now I will say that's named after Carl A. Scott at the Council, on, Council of Social Work Education, who firmly believed that um, the more people of color that were educated and went out into social work, that the curriculum would begin to change. So, you know, I served as president of CSWE in my previously. So I ask you, you know, right now they're revising and, and the educational policy is being revised and there are revisions. How do we make sure that the work that Annie's doing and the research that she is doing is included in the content? Not where someone says, oh, go find someone else, right? But to make sure that our scholars learn about the contributions of people of color in the curriculum, because far too often it's left out, right? It, it is left out. And so therefore people build on, we're still studying Eric Erickson, right? And we know that Eric Erickson does not, has not represented me, right? So how do we, how do we make sure that the research that Annie's doing is also included in that book, in our books? Gosh, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts. I know we don't have a lot of time, but I guess I will say, well, first of all, uh, we need funding for research that centers Asian American uh, perspectives. Right now we have less than 0.2% uh, of uh, federal funding that goes solely towards um, researching Asian American communities. That's less than one cent for every dollar. So just think about that for a moment. Um, how are we supposed to know anything about ourselves and our communities when, um, when there's no money for it? Uh, so that's problem number one. I also think about how just, I want to say two years ago, maybe one year ago, I was at, I think it was a CSWE conference. And I'm not going to say who it was, but let's just say it was one of our speakers, one of our key speakers um made a comment about when one of the listeners asked what about asian americans in this conversation on racism and the response was that um the stereotypes that are impacting asian americans are positive stereotypes so mm -hmm. you know it's it's not it's not really the same thing and i was so appalled that this person who had been chosen to speak at this national conference, 
you know, to all of these social work students, this emerging generation of rising social work students was getting and hearing this message. I, I just couldn't believe it. So the other piece of this is getting people in positions um, where they're, where they're of messaging, right, to social work bodies uh, that is um, accurate, mm -hmm. that is informed, uh, that is up to date, um, and that is a representative of, of all of us, including Asian Americans. So that's another piece that, that comes to mind. But one last thing that I also wanted to say, uh, the, the question we had just a moment ago about how do we work with our clients around anti-racism, it just kind of made me think about all the conversations I've had with you know, um, Asian American parents who are afraid to have these conversations with their children because they don't know what to say and they don't feel that they're equipped or they're not racial scholars. What's the right words? I don't know. I don't have the, you know, and, and they just don't go there. They don't want to cause more harm. And so I just want to encourage um, any parents that we have that might be listening that uh, it, I think more it's about just opening up space at home. It's not about a one-off conversation. Oh, now today I'm going to have the racism conversation. No, I, these are, it's an ongoing dialogue. And I think it's about normalizing the topic mm -hmm. of race identity, right? Racial relations. Um, how do you get along with people you don't have a lot of proximity with? What are assumptions we have of each other? Just opening up space for these types of conversations to occur naturally, mm -hmm. you know, at the dinner table, in the car, whatever. And they don't have to be so intense and heavy and long. They could be snippets of a minute, you know, 30 seconds, mm -hmm. just acknowledging something that happened in the news, just to put out there and send the message to our clients, to our children, that we are capable of holding space for these conversations. These are not things that we're going to ignore. And I think that goes a, a long way. And it, it doesn't, we don't have to have the answers. We just have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I exactly. think it's really important. Exactly. So I know that I told you that when we get on here and we're like, oh my goodness, you have 90 minutes. What are we going to do to fill up with 90 minutes? And then we're, we could say we could, I could sit and just refill your cups and we could just keep talking and talking. Um, but I am going to ask each of you to give a closing remark and then I'll take it home. Jess, we'll start with you with the closing remarks. Wow, uh, <laughs> closing remarks. Um, I well, you know, a lot of why I care so much about this is is really embedded in my my um, personal and spiritual values. So, I guess I'll just say that I think um, you know I believe that all of us are made in God's image, and so to me, what that means is that we're inherently created to love and be loved. And so it's from those values that, uh, you know, I just hope that things like um, education, right, will plant seeds of empathy uh, for a future harvest. And as Anne said, maybe we won't even be living to see that. But I do think that that work is still important to do. I think we um, are afraid of things and people that we don't know and understand. And so I, I hope that learning more about each other um, you know, is, is the path forward and really the best way of humanizing um, all of us. Mm -hmm. Annie? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in next. Um, I was so glad to be invited to, to be part of this because I am so in admiration of social workers and all that social workers do in so many different settings to help individuals and communities um, heal and be whole. And um, so in, in, in thinking about a final um, point, it is just that we have um, in all of our different spaces, ways of um, addressing the racism that is embedded in each of our settings and which then impact the folks that we work with. Um, and so having these conversations, engaging in reflection and assisting people in their healing, um, all, all social workers have such important roles in all of, the, of that, whether it's at the micro meso 
macro levels or um, if you if you want to think about it that way but in our everyday lives in our in our family interactions in our school parent um, interactions that we all have really important roles to play um, but it begins with conversations like these and and extending out that learning and then moving that into action and and working in solidarity all of those um, are ways in which we as social workers or psychologists or lawyers or whatever our professions are can really address anti-asian racism and um, oppression more widely So um, I guess um, I can go um, yeah. last. Uh, I just want to share, uh, I believe it was placed in the chat, Embrace Race is a great resource for talking to kids. Uh, it's for parents, it's for teachers and educators to talk to their kids about race. So I encourage folks to check that out. Um, just want to say what an honor and privilege it is to be with all of you um, and to be part of this esteemed panel. I just want to leave with a few lines of one of my favorite poems by Langston Hughes. Um, and I'll just read it. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, Oh, yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. Um, so that's inspiring to me. And um, I hope to all of you in terms of how we can come together uh, to make America what it should be for all of us. Manuel, you, you just quoted my favorite po poet. I have his big book. I use it all the time in all of my speeches because Langston Hughes is just, he had the words for us that live today. I want to thank all of you for joining me for tea. Um, when Do know that you have a friend in me. And I hope that I can, we can call upon each other to do some more work to uh, make sure that we, we stamp out the hate that's going in America. I do want to remind people that having hope sometimes, this is desperate times, but I'm going to tell you, I taught race relations at Westchester University for 30 years, and I used to tell my students, I'll never see an African-American president. And you know what? I had to learn to eat those words. And I also never thought that I would see a Black Supreme Court justice I had to eat those words. And I never thought we would have the, the right to marry whoever we loved, but I had to eat those words. So change is hard. It's a duck walk. Three steps forward, two steps back. But never give up, as John Lewis said. Never give in. Stand up. Speak up. Your work is important. Elevate it. Make sure, social workers, and anyone that's listening, that you have your own essential chats with your community, with your family, and begin to tackle these hard conversations. Listen to each other. Go to the primary sources. Our history is right there at the Library of Congress. All of the things that we're talking about, Chinese Exclusion Acts, all 9066, they're right there for you to read in history. Don't let somebody else tell your history to make them feel comfortable about what they did. Racism must be eradicated. I'm going to try to do it in my lifetime, and I'm going to keep on doing it until all of those flames are extinguished. So I thank all of you for joining me. I thank our listening audience. And with that, go do some work. Take an action. Thank you.